You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now, your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Koku, and we are broadcasting on the KWAZ radio platform. Um, before we get into today's show with our special, very special guest today, uh, let me do my customary free business shout out. Um, there's some I'm going to have to shout out next time I record, so forgive me for those of you who sent me information that I haven't added uh, to my queue yet. But for the time being, let's give a, a shout out to Stephanie Renee's Salon, located at 1614 West Main Street in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, you can contact Stephanie Renee's Natural Hair Care Products and More Salon at 269-459-6535. That's 269-459-6535. They are conveniently located inside Cali Beauty. So give them a call today if you're in that area. Also, you have amymarie.maven.com. That's amymarie.maven.com. Their mission is to provide high-quality products with unparalleled shipping or shopping experience. Um, they also sell uh, natural hair care products, so check out amymarie.maven.com. Uh, thanks again for, for tuning in to the Bitter Medicine Podcast after a brief hiatus. Uh, as you know, during the month of June, the Bitter Medicine Book Club was reading the book called King Leopold's Ghost. And uh, as promised, um, at the end of the month, as we will do uh, each and every month that we have a new book, we will do a broadcast. The intention is to do a live broadcast, but I kind of didn't figure it all out in time. Um, so stay tuned for that in the future, um, that we, we will be doing live broadcasts with um, our special guest today, Mr. Carl Hezekiah, who, who is the curator of books um, for the book club. Um, so again, today we're discussing King Leopold's Ghost, a very interesting, very, very interesting book, because if you didn't know that you are up against savages, they, they say that you're the savage, but if you, if you believe that and you didn't know who the real savage is or savages are, this book will let you know, um, explicitly who is the savage and who and who who is the oppressed and uh, before I introduce Carl and bring him into the program I want to play a clip um, that kind of you know gives a a little insight into what was going on in the Congo King Leopold's ghost is about the so-called king of Belgium Leopold um, and his conquest in the Congo in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And I'm going to play this clip called A Devil in the Congo. Devil Leopold II. That's, and that's really what we should call him, right? We should call him Devil Leopold, not King. But I want you to listen to this clip, and then I'm going to bring Carl in, and we're going to discuss the book. When a series of missionary photographs arrived in England in the late 19th century, they caused outrage. The mutilations had been strategically photographed against white for maximum impact. The children came from the Congo, but the man accused of their suffering was white, European, and royal. For 100 years, evidence has lain dormant of one of the greatest mass murders. 
millions of Africans died in one man's quest for wealth and glory. Until Adolf Hitler arrived on the scene, the European standard for cruelty was set by a king. Leopold II, King of the Belgians, was the personal owner of one million square miles of Central Africa and king sovereign of 20 million Africans. In the 1880s and 90s, the world outside Africa wanted rubber for its new bicycle and car industries, and Leopold's Congo Free State had the world's largest supply of wild rubber. The king had struck gold, black gold. He was determined to get as much rubber to Europe as he could, and as fast as he could. The rubber in this district has cost hundreds of lives. And the scenes I have witnessed while unable to help the oppressed have been almost enough to make me wish that I were dead. Over a period of 20 years, Leopold turned the Congo into a vast labor camp 80 times the size of Belgium, in the process making himself into one of the richest men in the world. As the number of deaths grew, so did his profits. This rubber traffic is steeped in blood. And were the natives to rise and sweep every white person on the upper Congo into eternity, there would still be left a fearful balance to their credit. White conquest is mythologized as benevolence, as bringing civilization to the Congo. Leopold's Congo was a prison state. Africans had no rights, no justice, and no freedom. They were there to serve a voracious European king. Thousands of miles away, Leopold was content that the end always justified the means, and the end was to make money. So there you have it. That's, um, that was from a, a clip from a documentary that kind of summarizes who Devil Leopold II of Belgium was and what he what he carried out in the Congo in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So today we're, you know, for the, for the month of June, we read this book called King Leopold's Ghost. Joining me today is the curator of the Bitter Medicine Blogs uh, book club, uh, Mr. Carl Hezekiah. Carl, are you on the line? I am on the line. Thank you for having me. No, no problem, man. Thank you for... Thank you for being a stand-up person who uh, took on this responsibility. I think reading is something that's um, absolutely fundamental for the human and seriously fundamental for any black or African human being on this planet. I mean... Yeah, you know Yeah. Uh, readers are leaders. Exactly. Readers are leaders. And um, the only way you're going to get up out of your oppression is if you read first. You have to read receive instructions, then write your own instructions, and then carry out the plan. So um, thank you for selecting this book. Carl, what made you select this book as the kickoff for the Bitter Medicine uh, Book Club for the month of June? Well, one reason is that how unknown this genocide in the Congo is. Mm. A lot of people have never heard of this. And I think it's very telling that in school we educate children about Adolf Hitler and atrocities, but yet black children are not taught about King Leopold and Henry Morton Stanley and other people who have committed acts of genocide against our race. Right. Uh, because honestly, I didn't know about Stanley either. So this book introduced me to several characters, so to speak, that I was unfamiliar with. And, uh, you know, I knew about Leopold and, and what he did, uh, the atrocities he carried out being ahead of, of ahead of Hitler's time. But, um, you know, again, so certain characters in this, and this is a real-life story, by the way, so I'm saying characters in a kind of ironic way. Some, some of the people in the story were unknown to me. So I appreciate you selecting this book because it, it, it really opened my eyes to just how deep and far-ranging it was. Um, so, Carl, what did you like best about the book? If there's such a thing as liking a book about African genocide. What did you like best about the book that tells that story? Well, 
what I enjoyed about the book, I really liked how the author really painted the picture. And it was a very grim, macabre picture, but he kept detailed records. He went into detail. He talked about the origin of the Congo when it came down to how the Portuguese encountered them. Uh, I really liked that the author took detailed notes. You know, he had firsthand accounts. He also spoke about the African people's resistance to this Congo. And this book really talked about how Europe came together and, you know, there were certain individuals like Casmet and Morel who really worked together to try to stop Leopold. But yeah, he also mentioned black people, black Americans, like uh, George Washington Williams mm-hmm. and Hezekiah Shannon, who came to the Congo as well. And they did their part to try to stop this brutality, this, this, this human atrocity from happening. That part often gets left out. Talk a little bit more about that last point you made. Okay. So before George, before the uh, Congo atrocities were well known, there were black men like George Washington Williams who went there. And he wrote an open letter to King to Leopold of Belgium detailing the atrocities and the, uh, the inhumanity that was being done there in his colony. And one thing also I want to mention is that many countries had colonies, but the Belgian Congo was a direct property of King Leopold himself. There was no government oversight as it was. It was any profits that came in directly were sent to him. Mm. So it was basically just theft on a, on a continental scale. But I mentioned um, George Washington Williams because he's also, he's often forgotten, but he did a lot of work and helped bring it to light as a black American, but he still felt a connection with African people on the continent and what was going on with them. So I think that his, his story, the author did a really good job in mentioning him as well as some of the other people. Uh, Hezekiah Shanu, he was another black man who actually gave direct information about the quotes and the, the rubber that was being taken from the Congo, yeah. the head counts and the body counts. He was delivering that directly to people in Europe who were opposing the genocide. You know, interestingly enough, um, the uh, the TV show, the old TV show, and they always try to bring it back every few years as a movie or a TV show, Tarzan is kind of mm. loosely... There's elements of Tarzan loosely taken from the Congo. And um, in the most recent Tarzan movie, um, they actually in- in- included um, um, George Washington in it. Yes, yes, I know. I saw that movie. Oh, you did? Oh, did you? So I, I yeah, kinda... but, uh, was it? It was uh, Samuel L. Jackson playing him. Yeah, it was Sam Jackson. And, uh, you know, Sam Jackson is a good actor, and so I guess his portrayal was a good one, but they didn't really get into um, him kind of reporting on the atrocities because they were telling that Tarzan story. What did you think right. of, right. of what, how did you feel having, you know, re- you know reading this book and, and then recognizing, uh, oh, this is him from the movie? How, how did that make you feel? I was annoyed, really, because they really just took, I don't know, they kind of made light of a serious situation. This isn't about, you know, some purported eight-man man through the jungle being raised by girls. This is a this is real people. This is a real atrocity. These people were dying at the time. So I don't think that the movie did it justice. I was I was annoyed. I was angry. I was I was really just, just disgusted at the whole situation. And it, 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 it was curious to me, too, because this is what I took from it. It was, it was curious to me that they would include a real person, George Washington Williams, in, in, a, in a kind of ridiculous story like that. And I, I started to wonder, what was really the agenda there? Because if you're not going to depict him as the person who really was a, def- a defiant black man, right, who was strong mm-hmm. enough to really tell a king off. I mean, let's be real. That's what he did in his, his letter. That's he, exactly what he did. He told a king off, right, a European king, um, so-called king. And, you know, to, um, 
to do that in real life and then be made like a caricature. I, I, I had to wonder what was the real agenda in that in that in that moment of of showing him in a, in a Tarzan movie because I, I I don't think they ever showed him before. Right, they've always tried to make light of our heroes. You know, they always try to take black people who have both done great things and you know minimize their contributions to to our race and our and society and the world. You know, when I, many times I hear about how people would describe black women like Sojourner Truth or Ida B. Wells as feminists. And if you look at what was going on back then, none of those white feminists, the Susan B. Anthony, they didn't give a damn about black women's struggle. Those and, Su- and Sojourner Truth are now being shown as feminists when in reality at that point in history, um, those white feminists could give less than a damn about black women's issues. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So now they just try to, you know, they try to make our struggle their struggle and try to, come, you know, benefit off of it. So I I mentioned, we, we, we were talking about George Washington Williams, and I mentioned how he basically told off a, a European king and how defiant that was. Let me, I had posted this on the Bitter Medicine blogs um, uh, page. Uh, let me just read his open letter, if you don't mind. All right. Um, George Washington Williams's open letter to His Serene Majesty Leopold II, King of the Belgians and Sovereign of the Independent State of Congo, by Colonel the Honorable Geo W. Williams of the United States of America, 1890. Good and great friend. This is how he, how he begins. Good and great friend. I have the honor to submit for Your Majesty's consideration some reflections respecting the independent state of Congo based upon careful study and inspection of the country and character of the personal government you have established upon the African continent. It afforded me great pleasure to avail myself of the opportunity afforded me last year of visiting your state in Africa and how thoroughly I have been disenchanted, disappointed, and disheartened It is now my painful duty to make known to your majesty in plain but respectful language every charge which I am about to bring against your majesty's personal government in the Congo has been carefully investigated. A list of competent and voracious witnesses, documents, letters, official records, and data has been faithfully prepared and will be deposited with her uh, Britannic Majesty's Secretary of State for foreign affairs until such time as an international commission can be created with power to send for persons and papers to administer oath and attest the truth or falsity of these charges. This this, this brother could write, too, by the way. Mm -hmm. There were instances in which Mr. Henry M. Stanley sent one white man with four or five Zanzibar soldiers to make treaties with native chiefs. The staple argument was that the white man's heart had grown sick of the wars and rumors of war between one chief and another, between one village and another, that the white man was at peace with his black brother and decided to confederate all African tribes for the general defense and public welfare. All the sleight-of-hand tricks had been carefully rehearsed, and he was now ready for his work. A number of electric batteries had been purchased in London, and when attached to the arm under the coat, communicated with a band of ribbon which passed over the palm of the white brother's hand, and when he gave the black brother a cordial grasp of the hand, the black brother was greatly surprised to find his white brother so strong that he nearly knocked him off his feet in giving him the hand of fellowship. When the native inquired about the disparity of strength between himself and his white brother, he was told that the white man could pull up trees and perform the most prodigious feats of strength. Next came the Lanzac. The white brother took from his pocket a cigar, carelessly bit off the end, held up his glass to the sun, and complacently smoked his his cigar to the great amazement and terror of his black brother. The white man explained his intimate relationship to the sun and declared that if he were to request him to burn up his black brother's village, it would be done. The third act was the gun trick. 
The white man took a percussion cap gun, tore the end of the paper which held the powder to the bullet, and poured the powder and paper into the gun, at the same time slipping the bullet into the sleeve of the left arm. A cap was placed upon the middle of the gun, and the black brother was implored to step off ten yards and shoot at his white brother to demonstrate his statement that he was a spirit and therefore could not be killed. After much begging, the black brother aims the gun at his white brother, pulls the trigger, the gun is discharged, the white man stoops and takes the bullet from his shoe. Now, I'm going to pause there because this letter is kind of going to be the crux of our discussion of of the book and the whole situation in the Congo. But we see, I mean, first of all, this um, George Washington Williams or Geo, Geo Williams is really a good writer. I mean, really, really a good writer. This is something that we should aim to be better writers too, not just better readers, but also better writers. And he he laid this thing out very nicely, but um, in this part, uh, he's talking about the tricks that the European, these white folks, was able to play on the African. What, what, what are your thoughts on how those Africans fell prey to those tricks? Well, I feel like, you know, the white man had never really had to fight his way on any shore. He was always accepted, mm. and yet he used the base humanity of African people, the Native American people, against them. And these tricks were, you know, done in a way to try to convince them we're superior than you are, and we should rule your land because we're better than you are. And it was really through through trickery and, and deception that they gained control over such territory, such a vast amount of territory. I think in the book they mentioned the Congo, is 76 times the size of Belgium. Yeah. yeah. So it just it just kind of shows the level of deception that, that the European is willing to use when it, when they can't use outright violence, they'll try to deceive you first. Only once the deception doesn't work that they switch to violence. Those are really the only two weapons that they that they have. Yeah, I mean and the the thing about it is that's a historic tactic of, of, of these white folks. They still do it today. Mm-hmm. They use deception to fool you today. Like, a deception I think they're using, if I'm being very honest, in fact, I know they're using it, is when they keep talking about these census reports and they say that blacks are 13% of the U.S. population, I think there's deception in that. Because I know that, that white folks classify all sorts of people from Northern Africa and stuff who are here, um, uh, people from India and stuff, they classify those as white people. Very true. But those aren't, those aren't white people. You know, those aren't, you know, w- what, what white people really means, you know, European folks, Caucasians from, f- from Europe. And so these numbers are conflated. And I, and I think that the black numbers are reduced. Uh, part of it, too, is a lot of us, I don't think, report to any census. And so those numbers are estimated, and they, they give you the low-end estimate. So why would they do that? Because when people start talking about black people showing some strength and standing up to um, the atrocities that are being you know, carried out against them here in the streets, against our children and our women and stuff like that, the first thing people tell you is, oh, you don't want a, a, a race war. Um, not that we're prepared for a war, per se, but um, they, they cite the number. They cite the number of whites versus the number of blacks and how it will be destruction. I think that scares a lot of black people from being strong. So the deception still goes on today. You know? And, yes, and, absolutely. And it, to me, when I read that in the book, I was like, man, it's crazy how politics, not, you know, politics, simple politics, sleight of hand and stuff was used to fool, you know, our ancestors who, you know, like I mentioned in a previous podcast, um, you know, our, our, you know, 
African people were once called the blameless Ethiopians. Like, you know, right. we we weren't on that that deviousness, so we weren't looking for it. And to see how simple and how that must have been so empowering to white folks to be able to play those simple games and get over, man, it, it really, it was a gut punch for me. Yeah, I agree. It was it was definitely hard to read that, and it's. I don't I don't blame asking people for being naive about it because they had never seen right. these things before. You know, it's just unfortunate they did not have any experience. And I I guess part of the thing I guess because when we earlier in the book we read about how the Portuguese first arrived in the Congo and how they showed up and they destroyed the kingdom of the Congo that existed prior to uh, King Leopold. And it's unfortunate that, that a written record of how the Portuguese dealt with the Africans was not passed down either orally or any other way so that way they could remember and have experience with dealing with these people and how they, how they interact with African people and how they've been known to use deception and violence and, and theft against Africans who live there. That's an excellent point. Um, Adam Hochschild, who who wrote this this best-selling novel, um, King Leopold's Ghost, he does speak about it in several instances, especially in the first um, part, the first section of the book. He does talk about how, for example, when you talk about the history of the Congo in that time, um, there isn't much of an African voice. In fact, George Washington Williams, Geo Williams, was like really the first black voice and he wasn't directly african he was a he was african from america um yeah but he but hochschild adam hochschild the author he does talk about it um in several occasions where it's a shame essentially that there was no black there was no africans who could tell the story and that's something we need to learn in fact this is a part of the reasons why um, I have this podcast as the, uh, the pro-black perspective podcast on KWAZ radio um, because it, it's telling us today, it informs us today that we need our own media. Without yes. media, without media, without authors, without, you know, y- you yourself, you're an author because you've authored several blogs on, on, on bittermedicineblogs.com and, um, you know, without those things, without our own historians and, you know, uh, people of that type of nature, we're bound to fall into the same groove again. It's bound to happen to us again. And this is why we have to be proactive now. Um, just to finish off that w- one last thing um, in Geo Williams's uh, letter to the devil Leopold II, he said, by such means, this is following right after the, the, the three types of tricks he was talking about. He said, by such means as these, too silly and disgusting to mention, and a few boxes of gin, whole villages have been signed away to your majesty. Now, when we hear several boxes of gin, that makes me think of another group. Mm. Who was screwed out yeah, of Yeah, we're mind. on the same page. Yeah, we're thinking the same thing, too. Yeah. So, you know, I tell people around me today, I tell people that um, a lot of this livacious living, the drugs, the, you know, like, our, uh, you know, all our youth uh, hair and the music is Molly, Percocet, this, that, and the other, syrup. That stuff is advertised to you. Mm-hmm. Because the powers that be knows that if they could get you on that stuff, they can take they can take you for everything. Yeah, it is the control. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying you can't have a drink or what have you from time to time, but when you when you base your culture around that, you know what I'm saying? Whole mm-hmm. whole villages will be signed away to his to his Majesty. You know what I'm saying? That's what Geo Williams is telling you 
how not only was it trickery and deception, but alcohol alone, which was their big thing at the time. I mean, they had opium and stuff too. But alcohol was a thing that made kings in Africa, who the Europeans called chieftains, made them make treaty, these one-sided treaties and sign over, you know, all, you know, the whole villages and, and all that stuff. And we got to learn from these things. So that, again, this is where this book was a, was a good book to understand what has happened in the past can happen in the future. And we're, we're living yeah. in that future now. I want to read one other paragraph, and then I'm going to ask you a, 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 a question directly pertaining to the book. Okay. Um, Geo Williams continues, he says, When I arrived in the Congo, I naturally sought for the results of the brilliant program, fostering care, benevolent enterprise, an honest and practical effort to increase the knowledge of the natives and secure their welfare. I had never been able to conceive of Europeans establishing a government in a tropical country without building a hospital. And yet, from the mouth of the Congo to its headwaters, here at the Seventh Cataract, a distance of 1,448 miles, there is not a solitary hospital for Europeans and only three sheds for sick Africans in the service of the state, not fit to be occupied by a horse. Six sailors frequently die on board the vessels at Banana Point, and if it were not for the humanity of the Dutch trading company at that place, who have often opened their private hospital to the sick of other countries, many more might die. There is not a single chaplain in the employ of your majesty's government to console the sick or bury the dead. Your white men sicken and die in their quarters or on the caravan road and seldom have Christian burial. With few exceptions, the surgeons of your majesty's government have been gentle, have been gentlemen of professional ability devoted to duty, but usually left with few medical stores and no quarters in which to treat their patients. The African soldiers and laborers of your majesty's government fare worse than the whites because they have poor quarters, quite as bad as those of the natives, and in the sheds called hospitals, they languish upon a bed of bamboo poles without blankets, pillows, or any food different from that served to them when well rice and fish. Carl, in the book, we read about these explorers. And in the first part of the book, um, we read about one explorer called Stanley. Mm, yes. Yeah. What are yes, your thoughts on Stanley? Well, uh, Stanley was like many, many uh, white explorers at the time. You know, he made his famous trek to find, you know, David Livingston, and who had been lost and no one had heard from him. So the goal was to try to locate, you know, Dr. Livingston's where to get the famous saying, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So... But Stanley's behavior, how he treated the African people who he found there, who who were under his command, and it says in the book on page 110, far from being a great hero, Stanley had been a tyrant. His name produces a shudder among the simple folk when mentioned. They remember his broken promises, his copious profanity, his hot temper, his heavy blows, his severe and rigorous measures by which they were multiplicated of their land. Hmm. So... It says, of the hundreds of Europeans and Americans who traveled to the Congo, Williams is the only one on record as questioning Africans about their personal experience with Stanley. So Stanley was, was a homicidal maniac to these African people. And again, we glorify him as we glorify other these so-called European explorers. To me, how can you explore someplace where millions of people already live? You know, you just didn't know about it. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Is the so my opinion, I've always had a low opinion of him. You know, they try to portray him as some sort of grand explorer. He was he was a fraud. Absolutely, he, he made it a, a purpose to get white white men who are of less ability to him than him, so that way he could outshine them. Mm-hmm. Which is 
similar to what they do white folks now. That's <laughs> true. That's very true. You know, that's very similar to what they do white folks now. And, you know, I'm not really worried too much about white folks, but, um, you know, they, they have poor whites. And, I mean, who are in generational poverty. But mm-hmm. because of whiteness and the idea of white power or white supremacy, they have those poor whites still fighting the cause for whiteness, not realizing right. that you're suffering economically just as much as black folks are, sometimes worse even. And that's it the was an, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. It was an American president, Lyndon B. Johnson, said, if you can convince the lowest white man he's better than the best colored man, he won't notice you're picking his pocket. Yep. Give him somebody to look down on and empty his pockets for you. Yep. And, um, again, we see where this has been going on in Europe. You know, only to say from the pro-black perspective podcast, he once said to me, he said, you got to understand something that the, that whitey, they're savages to whitey. Yes, they are. You know what I'm saying? They're savage to their own, much less to someone else. Yes. Only... Every, every atrocity, every act of violence that has been done to black people, they were doing it to white people first. Yes, yes. They didn't just show up in Africa with chains and, and whips and everything. They, they had been practicing that on their own people for centuries, yeah. burning women alive for being witches, you know, all sorts of horrible tortures. They, that was already in them before they even met black people. Absolutely. Absolutely. They had, they had tried that out on themselves before. Mm-hmm. And in that last paragraph I read, um, you know, uh, Geo Williams talks about the the savagery of the European, even to his own people. So Leopold didn't even give a shit about, Leopold, Stanley, they didn't give a shit about the fact that their own people were dying, were languishing in, in the, you know, under these bad conditions and dying. And he also, Geo Williams also mentions that, you know, what happened to all of this talk about, um, being humanitarian, being benevolent, um, fostering care. Mm. Now, that is spoken about in, in this book, King Leopold's Ghost, to great detail. Can you tell the listeners about how Leopold, again, using deception, but he used a specific type of deception, how was Leopold able to carry out any of these atrocities how, in fact, what led him into the Congo? Well, Leopold wanted a slice of what he called that great African cake. Yeah. He wanted, he desired colonies for Belgium because he knew it was through colonies that countries like Great Britain, great, countries like Spain and France had become wealthy and powerful. So he wanted to have colonies of his own. Most of the world had already been colonized at that point. The French were in uh, the Caribbean, they were in Indochina, the British ruled most of they ruled India, which was a wealthy colony. Most of the Caribbean was controlled by Great Britain. So he was searching for colonies, places he could exploit and have that wealth transported back to Belgium. He wanted Belgium to be a, a player on the world stage and knew that sub-Saharan Africa was one of the few places that colonies could still be had. Mm-hmm. And so when uh, go ahead. No, I was going to say that um, once Stanley had explored the interior, because most of the interior was unknown to Europeans, they had no idea what lied, you know, beyond the coast due to their inability to really reach the interior of Africa. And Arabs had come in, you know, they had done their own slave trade, which I feel is criminally neglected. We don't, we rarely don't speak enough about the Arab slave trade that was going on at the same time as the European slave trade. But most Europeans didn't really know what was in the interior. Once explorers like Stanley and everybody else came from inside Livingston and reported the things that could be found there, it kind of caused a, the desire for um, colonies in sub-Saharan Africa 
led to the Council of Berlin, to where the African continent was basically carved up among the, the various European nations. And um, Leopold used his influence to get the largest piece of it, if he could. This is African cake, as he called it. Mm-hmm. And what the book reveals that I wasn't fully aware of, the book reveals that Leopold was able to get um, his state, the Congo, recognized by the world because he went and appealed to the world that he was doing like a humanitarian effort Mm. and that he was trying to help the natives. And uh, through that deception, because he, again, Europeans... White people deceive white people. Yes, right? they do. White people are savage to white people. This is where you get all this espionage and all this shit from, right? Um, yes, right. Um, so Leopold went and fooled the world that, you know, he was going in there and trying to bring c- civility to the people. And most people didn't give a shit, and so they allowed it to go down without ever re-inquiring as to what was really going on. So those explorers were were mapping out the place so that Leopold could build um, what you call thoroughfares, you know, trains and, uh, and uh, steamline routes and stuff through Africa so that they could get the stuff out of Africa that they wanted to make the money off of. As, right. it, as it turns out, the big thing, and this was also eye-opening for me, the big thing that they exported out of Africa was rubber. Now, what was the eye-opener there for me is where I come from, we have rubber trees, but these weren't rubber trees. These were rubber vines. These were vines right. of some sort that they were able to extract rubber from. Mm-hmm. And the book starts to detail, I mean, just the lack of care of, 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 for life, for just human life, in terms of making people afraid to, you know, using fear tactics to get people to, 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 to cultivate this rubber and stuff like that, and also to, to build a, the, the train lines and, and things of that nature. And they, the book talks about how, like, people are just shot in the, in the head and in the face and just killed like it was nothing. Um, there was a, a scene that they describe in the book where two men are sitting on a coastline, I think it was, and there was an African on, a, on a, like a canoe minding his business going across this river or whatever, and they decided to have target practice to see who could who could fall the African. Do you remember that in the book? Mm. Yes, I do. Yes, I was. I remember that. And, it, it, you know, the book does a good job of just capturing how, um, how the African, African's body was viewed, and it parallels to this day. The African body yeah. is used as a thing that's nothing. So your children are viewed as nothing. This is why your children could be shot and killed in the street. You are viewed as nothing. And I'm, I'm talking about, when I say your children, I mean the, the collective of, of us in America. And it's the same thing going on. And Adam Hochschild, he... He gets into the psychology of that, and I, I want anyone who's reading that to highlight that part of the book. He talks about how when you make it that the African is less than, it's easier for the soldiers of oppression, right? The race soldiers, if you will. It's easier for them yeah. to take your life. Once you dehumanize yeah. the, the, the human, the African human, it's nothing for them to take your life, you know? That's um, true. Yeah. You, know, you, you had situations in this book where, where people would have gardens of human heads. Yes. Talk about, talk about that. I think that was, was that Rom who was doing that? Yes, it was. Yes. Yeah. Um, he, he 
The, now, one thing I want to say is that many, we don't realize that the role that many Europeans played a part, but it was many black, the, the, the uh, force public, the uh, army of the, of the Belgian Congo at that time was majority black. They took their marching orders from, from the Europeans, but these were black men that were, that were being led by, you know, these, these white men coming to the Congo and committing all types of crimes. And as a, I don't know if it was a, a trophy, he kept a garden of human heads on display and black people who just happened to displease him, they would kill them and they would join that guard. That's the, you, you, you touched on, and I was going to touch on it a little bit later, but it, now is as good time as any. The force public, um, oh. <laughs> force public, public means the, the public force in, um, what language is that? French, I think. The public force. Yeah, and, they, yeah, that's right. It's the French and Belgium. Yeah, and basically, the force public or the public force was a military force in the Congo from about 1885 um, through about 1908 or something like that. Uh, in fact, I think they actually mm -hmm. went on longer than that too. I think they were around too when Lumumba was around as well in the 60s. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that they are. I think that they once the Congo became independent from Belgium, they became a part of the Belgian army. It became part of the army yes. of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Yeah. Now, what are your thoughts? Expand a little more on your th thoughts of this force, this public force of Africans from the Congo, by the way. Mm who were carrying out the orders of, of the devil Leopold? Well, the, Euro the Europeans have always used divide and conquer when they come in situations where they may not be, where they may be numerically outnumbered. But it serves their advantage to take groups of the native population, raise them up above others, create like a buffer force against their aggression, and send them against their own people. So in one way, it protects them because the hatred is being directed towards their own people. Yeah. And yet they do the dirty work. They don't have to get their hands dirty. And they're able to, you know, play groups against one another. And in the end, they're, they were the ones to reap the benefits. Now that they have this African force of people who are trained, they can go in and mingle amongst the population. It's, it's very devious how they do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So to see, and the force public, from what I understand, um, wasn't only Africans from, from the Congo. It was some white boys from, um, but the, the, the white boys were officers. That's the thing. So the guys yeah. carrying out, putting in the work were the Africans. And the white boys from Europe, like Italy and Switzerland and stuff, they were the officers, like commanding officers. So it was... You saw your own brother, or what should be your own brother. You saw them when you saw the, the false public, and that happens today. Yes. I recently, I don't know if you saw it, I recently posted a comment on um, social media where um, I, I, I've noticed something, I've seen it a lot even in recent weeks, where there's a lot of mistrust even in the conscious or pro-black community where you, 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 you'll notice like you don't get the camaraderie from a fellow black person who's, who's, in, who's in his or her consciousness. And there's a lot of suspicion and all this kind of stuff. And the problem with that is when you're so suspicious of everyone around you, you know, um, mm -hmm. you can't organize, you can't build anything. And yes, I know there's a history of the force public. There's a history of Cointel Pro. I'm aware of all of that. But the problem with those situations was the vetting pro process and the compensation right. process. The force public, those Africans were compensated for what they did. Yes, they were. The main compensation was the ability to live. Because we also have to remember that there's fair tactics in this too. If they didn't do what they did, and I'm not at all 
you know, um, supporting what they did, but they would be dead too. So to live, they fought. They carried out orders. And so we as the modern day African, we need to understand that we need to compensate our people, to have a mechanism of compensation for our own people so that they can't be persuaded from others to carry out the works of others. Right. You know? Absolutely. Because we, we have to provide alternatives, economic alternatives to people so that way they're not um, tempted to, to betray us for, you know, trinkets and gold. But then also, too, we have to understand the psyche of, of many African people has been as Dr. Amos Wilson would say, it has become maladjusted within the oppression of the system that we live in. So sometimes they'll betray us just for recognition from a white person, oh, just man. to feel closer to white people. Man, man, man. That's a, that's a true thing you just said right there, man. Um, just to be recognized. And it's sad that that's our psychology now, where a lot of white folk, uh, sorry, a lot of black folks are, they just want to get a pat on the head. You know, that's how I yeah. imagine the fourth yeah. public to be. Some black guys who, some of them did it to, as a, as a survival tactic, a personal survival tactic. But I'm sure there was a good many of them who did it just to get that pat on the head. Yeah. You know, um, let me take a quick commercial break. Stay on the line for me. Um, let me do this quick commercial break, and on the other side, we'll talk a little bit more about the book specifically, okay? Okay, sure thing. All right. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. When will African people have basic rights? When will we be protected? When will our cost of living be eliminated? When will our cultures be preserved? We need a new leadership. One that has studied the problems and learned the solutions. The Pro-Black Compendium is the book to start off that leadership. Quotations, essays, poems, stories, codes of conduct, curricula, principles, relationship advice, marketing tips, group economics, games, book clubs, movie nights, chronologies, civilizations, wars, warriors, authors, songs, conflict resolution, the list goes on. There is no book more necessary for starting our people on the path to African redemption. Greetings, family. This is Koku, host of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. In case you didn't know, we have an online book club called the Bitter Medicine Book Club. Every month, we will select a book to inspire the Bitter Medicine Podcast listening audience to read along together. At the end of the month, we will have a call-in show and book discussion. This is a great, dynamic way for readers to not only enjoy a book, but also have others to bounce ideas off of. They say if you want to keep anything away from black people, put it in a book. Don't allow this to be true. Head over to BitterMedicineBlogs.com and subscribe to our newsletter for important updates. Do that today. Join our reading collective today and empower yourselves, your family, and your community. Peace and blessings. Peace Seeker, Malcolm X, John Henry Clark, Joseph Ben Yakinen, Edward Porkchop Davis, and others took notes from Carlos A. Cooks and might not have obtained their nationalistic fervor nor worldview had they not heard Cooks. 
This is Oni from the pro-black perspective, author of the pro-black compendium, and Zubiri and the Maroons of Ma'a. I scan two out-of-print books valuing $800 new on Carlos A. Cooks, the foremost black nationalist after Garvey, and added Cooks magazines into one ebook that I can send you for your reciprocity. Send some love to cash.me slash dollar sign ABS only with the subject Carlos and your email address. And if your love is strong for your people, you'll get a book. If your love is too weak, you'll get a refund and you should double your love next time. Carlos is the missing link who was probably the greatest mind in the world from 1940 to 1966, standing over King and Malcolm like a giant over midgets. These are the missing pages of black history from the 1940s to the 1960s. I just need you to believe in your way of reciprocity, and as you give, you will receive. Cash.me slash dollar sign ABS only. Show me you value your story. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Koku. And uh, today we have a discussion with Mr. Carl Hezekiah, who is the curator of books for the Bitter Medicine um, Blogs Book Club. And uh, the book we read during the month of June was King Leopold's Ghost by Adam Hochschild. Um, we've been having a lively discussion talking about um, aspects of the book, aspects of what was going on in the Congo at the time, and how it kind of relates to what's going on today. To continue that that discussion, Carl, um, let's talk about two things. Well, let's talk okay. about one thing in, in this segment in two parts. Uh, the use of religion in the conquest of the Congo. <clears throat> what were your thoughts from the book in terms of how religion was used, or how Christianity in particular was used? And also there's an inference uh, at Islam in the book too that there was kind of a war against the Arabs and their Islam. Did you get that sense in the book as well? Yes, yes I did. And I really think that what they were trying to do is that they were trying to say that, oh, we're going to come in there with our good Christian values and end this horrible Arab slave trade. And that was one thing they, they really specified. We have to stop the Arabs from brutalizing these people. Um, one of the most well-known Arab slave trader was a black man known as Tipu Tip, who was notorious around, you know, in Africa as being a slave trader and, and um uh, just a general piece of garbage. Yeah. And, you know, he, he so their, the goal of the Belgians and the other people was to use their Christian, you know, go there and use their missionaries and everything to fight against the Arabs, these evil Muslims, but they were committing the same atrocities. It wasn't, one wasn't better than the others. Is do you want to be shot? Or do you want to be stabbed? They're both equally bad. Yeah. And it's mentioned in the book, especially on um, page 27, the beginning of the book, it says that Britain has only a dubious right to the high moral view of slavery. British ships had long dominated slave trade, and only in 1838 had slavery formally been abolished in the British Empire. But the British quickly forgot all this, just as they forgot that slavery's demise had been hastened by large slave revolts in the British West Indies, brutally and with increasing difficulty suppressed by British troops. In their opinion, slavery had come to an end throughout most of the world for one reason only, British virtue. So I, I guess they're really trying to, you know, make a big thing the way Christianity was going to stop the, the influence of Islam. But then also Christianity was used to pacify, which is still used today. Mm -hmm. It's used to pacify African people and to endure their suffering to hope for a, a better future in the hereafter. Yeah, and we still see that going on today. And what's interesting, we still have the Arab problem in terms of their, uh, in terms of their religion, in the black community as well. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Tipu Tip, um, who was this uh, 
people, what was he, Zanzibar? Z- Zanzibar? Zanzibar, yeah. Yeah. Um, a Swahili, uh, what do they call it, a Swahili strongman, Tipu Tip, who was this, who was this black man, um, this African, and uh, he was heavily involved with the African Arab um, slave trade. And eventually, the Force Public actually went to war. What was that? The Congo War, I think? The Congo Arab War? Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They eventually went to war with him, too. But again, we see where the religion, um, when Nkrumah, when Kwame Nkrumah and those guys tell you about the prayer and who who ended up with the book and who ended up with the land. That's not an exaggeration. That's historical. Not at all. You know, these savages with their so-called priests and stuff came into Africa and got, and, and this is the thing that really gets me with the story. And I think you may have commented on this when I posted to social media, I said something like, what was the deficiency in African spirituality that allowed them or led them to accept the foreign invaders' spirituality? Now, a lot of folks will point to the gun, and I do agree, and we're going to talk about the gun in a, in a few, too. I do agree mm-hmm. that the gun was there, too, but... W- and. Maybe I shouldn't take the accounts of Europeans too seriously, but when I read it, I always get the sense that Africans also didn't mind adopting this new religion. Is is that your sense of it, or do you disagree? I would disagree, because okay. I think it was more than just gun. I think it was just sheer brutality. It was torture. It was tearing out people's tongues. It was burning people alive to the point where it was a rash... I don't want to say rational choice, but because I can't really speak, I didn't live at that time. Yeah. But then, nobody wants to see their children killed or tortured. So nobody wants to see their grandparents torn apart limb from limb. So I think that it was a choice that hey, you either convert or you die, and that was really the, the overwhelming power that they had. It was it was just sheer terror. It was terrorism. That there was no deficiency in African spirituality. Mm. It was just you either do this or you die, and we kill you and your whole family. And that's really how I took it as. Mm. I, I think that they would convert it only because out of out of sheer fear and, and their their desire to not be tortured in this way. So just before we started reading this book, Kanye West. Um, oh, love it. <laughs> <laughs> Kanye West had his now infamous rant about how it seems to him that to have been enslaved for essentially 400 years, I, it was bondage for 260 something years, and then Jim Crow and all of this stuff until now. So it's been 400 mm-hmm. years now, um, which is all still slavery. Um, Kanye is saying that seems like a choice to him. And he he got a he got a lot of backlash for it as he deserved. Um, Mm -hmm. but the question I had, once again, I had this question on social media and a lot of people couldn't really answer it. I think you did comment. Um, for some reason, the African, our ancestors, our people, for some reason, we're always told or, or it's always suggested to us, we should have just accepted death. Now, other groups have been subjugated, have been oppressed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we, we hear about it, about some of those groups all the damn time uh, with, their right. ho- with their Holocaust. But, you know, no one ever said they should have all just allowed themselves to be, you know, wiped off the face of the earth. Right. Same thing with the so-called Native Americans. No one ever says, well, they should have just accepted complete and utter genocide. Why is it the African is always kind of told or suggested that we are weak because you didn't accept complete annihilation and removal from the earth? Why do you think that is? 
Well, I think part of that is among black people, among African people, we have low racial self-esteem. Mm. We don't feel like we deserve good things. We deserve just to get by. Mm. And if you do a, a, a proper historical analysis, black people have been enslaved far less than, say, for example, in Europe. The Russians, for example, had the system of serfdom, which was basically slavery, yeah. for thousands of years. From the, from the time of the fall of the Roman Empire, there was feudalism, which is, which is slavery in everything but name. Yeah. Um, Native Americans are probably suffer still from their genocide. There are some tribes that do well, but then you have places like the Pine Ridge Re- Reservation in South Dakota, which doesn't even have indoor plumbing, which doesn't have running water. And people have epidemic rates of suicide, uh, depression, alcoholism. So I think that it's easy to say that because black people do have a low racial self-esteem. But if you look at it from a rational view, we have done above and beyond much better. Even with Europeans, they were under oppression for thousands of years. You know, for the time that we have been under oppression, we have done astoundingly well. And we have to realize that, that revolution and recovering from this is a multi-generational struggle. It's not something that happens overnight. The Irish were enslaved in their island for hundreds of years by the British. You know, so a lot of us don't understand that history, which is why it's important to study not just our history, but other groups' history to see the things that they did wrong and to try to give a, a better view on the things that we went to, through as well. And, and I, I, I like that you said that because in the book, um, they talk about these missionaries and human rights advocates. They talk to a guys like uh, Roger Casement, who was a white, mm-hmm. who was a white guy, if I remember correctly. Um, Morell. We talked about George Washington Williams, um, and there was William Henry Shepard, right? Yes, and, yes. And those guys were the guys who began to talk about the atrocities and how women and children were imprisoned and how hold, how, how entire tribes were wiped out for resistance. So it's important to mention that there was resistance and we've always resisted. Yes. Always, always, always. Just like I was reading before in the earlier passage about how the slave revolts in the Caribbean that led to the British to in slavery there. It wasn't just because they the better angels of their nature, they were getting their asses whooped. They were getting tired of getting whooped. It was, slavery became too expensive, too dangerous to maintain. Yeah. To, to maintain economically and from a human capital standpoint as well. They were losing a lot of people. People don't talk about yes. it in history. But they lost a lot yep. of people. A lot of their armies were came back as half or a quarter of what it was when it left. So, you know... For you black folks, you Africans who are listening, understand that your history has been one of resistance. It's just that technologically, you've been overpowered oftentimes. And yes. That, yes. that goes back to a podcast I did way back uh, where I talked about STEM education in the black society. If you're not on top of your technology game, you cannot be on top of your economics game. You can't be on top of your military game. And that's where we are today still. Yes. You know, we're still there. And uh, books like this kind of highlight the fact that we're talking about something that happened in 1890. And it still applies to our community today. That's kind of pitiful. It is. It is, and I, I, I guess when I read about these, these wars and these battles, the greatest defeat inflicted on the British Army was done by the Zulu, mm-hmm. and they, all they had was their spears. Once the British ran out of ammunition, it was a massacre. And, but one thing I remember Kwame Ture said is that the only people who are ashamed of African history are those who are ignorant of African history. Beautiful. Yeah. And the technological advantage that the Europeans had as a result, you know, they had a machine gun. They called it the Maxim gun. They could pour yes. bullets into a pan and crank the handle and just, you know, mow down people. They used that to great effect in Africa and Asia against the samurai in Japan. Mm-hmm. So their technological 
advancement has always been used against us. And I, I think that we really, like you said, we really do have to come up with ways to counter the Europeans' ability to subvert us. Mm-hmm. Because it, unless we do that, any any institutions we build are going to be destroyed until we come up with a way to counter their ability to destroy what we build. So when you talk about countering what they do, when you read the book King Leopold's Ghost, um, a couple of things stand out to me what Europeans did to the early to those Africans at the time in the Congo. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I read um, Geo Williams's um, the three things he talked about how white folks made you know made themselves to be spirits and they could create fire out of the thin air and they could get shot at and not be killed and you know all 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 those sleight of hands type of things. But they also in this book they speak heavily about how. And it reminded me of the Native Americans again. Um, they speak heavily about how a lot of African chiefs or kings received beads and cloth. Mm. And that was enough for them to sign over these treaties with, with uh, Leopold, you know, with Belgium for these exports and, the, and, and to have their people you know, show these Europeans how to navigate the, 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 the land and stuff like that. And it's, again, it's still happening today. We get swayed by trinkets, by nothing. Right. Right. You know, we get swayed by nothing and we give up everything. You know, so I find it interesting that these savages, these Europeans, was able to use... These, you know, these minute things, these almost insignificant things to get all of these resources. And it seems like that's what happens now. Like in today's world in America, black folks tend to get these little symbolic victories. These, you know, you get an Obama or you get, you know, an Obama saying something nice or whatever. And you take that and you you live with that. And you give up everything yeah. else. You give up. You you give up access to your community. Now all these mm-hmm. foreign invaders are now setting up shop in your community. So it's the same thing happening today, and we have to break. We have to break it, and the and the one way we have to break it is through being knowledgeable of the fact that our African ancestors before us, they did fight back. They just weren't able to overcome the technology that the Europeans had at the time. You mentioned the Maxim right. gun, and I was going to talk about the Maxim gun. There were songs written about the Maxim gun. Europeans had songs because they understood that that gun is, the, is really the only thing that kept them on top, and it's the same thing yeah. right now. It's the gun. Talk about that a little bit. Well, uh, one thing I want to mention is that I think that the, the African concept of ownership and land was probably very different from the, than the, the white people, the Europeans. Um, they usually held land in common. So in their mind, it wasn't, you know, this is my land, this is your land. I don't know if they really had a, a true understanding of um, really what they were signing away. Just like the myth about the, uh, the Native Americans who gave Manhattan Island to the Dutch for $24 worth of beads. Yeah. In their culture, you can't own land anymore than you can own the ocean or own the sky. Right. The land was, was to be held in common for everyone. Right. So I think that, you know, coming from their, their points of view, they didn't realize what they were doing at that time because they didn't have any, any reference or any framework to go against that. But as far as the weaponry, um, I think that gun ownership, especially among black people, is, is very important. Talk about it. There's more guns in the United States than there are people. Yeah. So we have to train, but also understand we need more than just firepower. We're going to need to have cooperative economic as well. We're going to have to literally retrain our minds to think in a way that empowers us. I had uh, Maj Touré on from Black Guns Matter. On my show. Yeah, I love that interview. That was a good video. That was a good uh, podcast. Thank you. And uh, one of the things that we discussed in that 
in that episode. Um, people today like to talk about the gun, that the guns today were not what the so-called founding fathers of America were talking about. But as Maj and I discussed and he brought up, um, the Maxim gun was as destructive as any AR-15 is today, really. Yeah. The only difference is what people don't understand about guns. The only difference is the way they improve guns, they improve guns to not jam. But it's the same type of destruction, right? So those, those Maxim guns could jam on you. Right. Giving your opponent a window to attack. And right. what they do with guns is they really improve upon the ability for them not to heat up, expand, and jam. But it's the same type of it's the same type of weapon. So as Marge said and as you just said as well, black folks need to understand that this gun thing has always been around. And it has led mm-hmm. to your, it has led to your prolonged oppression, and you can't be afraid of these guns now. It's time for you to get with the technology and to arm yourselves and protect your community. You have to meet Absolutely. a force with force. You know what I mean? You can't give away to if you give away to a force, you're gonna lose everything. You have to meet force with with force. You have to police and protect your communities. But as you mentioned, you have to have an economic code and you need to have a social code as well. What, what we're missing in black society is a social code as well. The force public lacked a bit of a social code until they didn't. Because one thing we didn't talk about is that the force public eventually turned against those Belgians, didn't they? Yes, yeah, yeah, they did. There were several revolts against the uh, the Belgians by the force public. See, the force public was smart. They got armed. They understood some strategy. And they turned that around on the Belgians eventually. Yeah. They had to. It was, it was a matter of life and death. What was it that led to them turning against the Belgians? I think it was the Belgians' just sheer brutality. Their, their, um, their cruelty that they were willing to use the whip against their uh, their own people. There was a, it mentioned, I'm probably going to say this wrong, the Chikachi, it was a whip made of hippopotamus hide. I, I can't even imagine how that would, how that would feel, what, what type of wound that would inflict, that they would use to maintain discipline in their ranks. Yeah. So it was really the Belgians maybe going a bit too far and the, to where the members of the force public said enough is enough. Yeah, I mean, for, for those of you who who didn't get a chance to read the, the book, but essentially you had the force public, the foot soldiers were these Africans from the Congo who were carrying out a lot of the atrocities themselves. But remember that their commanding officers were these Low, low-level savage Europeans from Italy and France and, and Switzerland and stuff, and these white boys were were, be, were were very disrespectful to the black to the Africans who made up the force public, and eventually it got too much, you know. Um, like Bob Marley says, if you go to the well, one day the bottom will drop out, you know. So. That bottom dropped out, and the force public turned against the um, the Belgians, and actually took out a lot of Belgians. Uh, but eventually, if I remember correctly, the force public didn't have enough weaponry, and a lot of times they were either killed or they had to um, run to what was it, the Sudan? Yes, that's right. Yeah, they had to flee to the to the Sudan or make some kind of deal and get out of there. But again, um, you know, you've always had you've always had those types of 
Africans, the ones who will work with the oppressor, but you've all, always had Africans who would, who would rebel against the oppression at some point as, as well. And the Maxim gun was what was used to conquer not only our people, but many other peoples, as you mentioned, the samurais in Japan, etc. And what it tells us, what it informs us today, now we have a little bit more reach now. We need to arm ourselves and protect ourselves because other than that, you know, that, that, that is what's going to kind of equalize what's going on with us as, as far as oppression goes. Carl, um, did this book, King Leopold's Ghost, did this remind you of any other book that you've read? Mm-hmm. I, I can't really, well, yes, it, it kind of did. And, you know, speaking about the atrocities and, and the genocide, it really reminded me of um, a book I read by um, Eric Williams. He was former the prime minister of Trinidad. He wrote a book on the, uh, the history of the Caribbean yeah. called From Columbus to Castro. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he, in that book, he talks about the, uh, the African slave trade, the genocide of the indigenous people of the Caribbean, the Taino Indians. Um, he really goes into detail about this and how vital this African slave trade was to making those colonies of uh, Jamaica, the Bahamas, uh, San Dominique, you know, the Haiti and the Dominican Republic, so vital and so rich. I think that it was said that just the, the French side, slave labor, the oppression and the brutality of African people, it really did kind of, you know, form parallels in my mind. Yeah, um, I, I think um, you selected our July book, um, mm. and it made me think of that book a little bit. Yes, yes, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa by Walter Rodney. One thing I did not like about this book, um, King Leopold's Ghost, mm-hmm. is the author says something towards the end is that Africa's condition, or current condition, is not just a result of European colonization. And um, he says, as on the last page, page 318, he says, the reason most of Africa has not done so far beyond the colonial heritage, one factor is the abysmal position of women and all the violence, repression, and prejudice that go with that. Another is the deep-seated cultural tolerance, even hero worship of strong men like Mobutu. And I really took offense to that, you know, and he was a good writer, but I don't think that we really understand the, the damage and the, the lasting effects of European colonialism that have caused um, the conditions that black people, not just in Africa, but all over the world face. So I really wanted to read uh, how Europe underdeveloped Africa to kind of give more perspective on that. Mm. Yeah, I thought uh, I thought your selection was a good follow to this book, and uh, I look forward to having a discussion about that at the end of this month as well. Uh, Carl, um, before you read this book, King Leopold's Ghost, how how much of the story did you know before you actually read the book? I knew a little. Some of the other atrocities that were ongoing in Africa at that time, um, the Herrero people in Namibia, for example, that, that open naked genocide done by the Germans. So I was familiar with the topic, but I didn't know to the extent that it was going on. Would, would you recommend any other books that kind of give, you know, that help give you some background knowledge before reading this book? Like, like what, like what, resources did you have before? Was it a book or something that you read that that gave you some knowledge of the topic of this book? Yes, actually. Um, it's actually, um, it's a book called Reversing Sale. Mm. New Approaches to African History. That was one book that I, I really enjoyed and that kind of gave, gave me a little more insight about what was going on. Um, Anything by Dr. John Henry Clark. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Af- Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust. Mm-hmm. That's another good book that kind of gave me some insights in, in what was going on. 
And Carl, um, what did you think about the author's research? Was it easy to see where the author got his information? Were the sources credible, as far as you know? Like, what? As far as I know, the sources were very credible. And I really liked in the book how he mentioned all of the, how he noticed the, uh, the record keeping, all of the, the things that were being taken from the Congo. But the only thing they were taking to the Congo were bullets. Yeah. So that, that one chapter called The Secret Society of Murderers, I really, I like the title of that title because really, that's really what it was. Um, they were basically just taking resources, rubber, uh, everything they could from the Congo, and all they were giving back was weapons. So it let the, the people know this is not a, a trade, this is not a colony or a benevolent re- uh, enterprise. This is straight up theft. This is a kleptocracy where this is just everybody steal what they can and get as much as you can while they're getting good. A uh, crazy question for you. Sure. What did you think of the title of the book as it pertains to what's, to the, to what's being told in the book? Hmm. That's not a crazy question. I, 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 um, I never thought about it. I guess I would say the title was appropriate because even after King Leopold died, his, his policies and the things he did, even to this day, still affect that region of the world and also the, the, the larger world around it. Yes. He, Africa is still haunted by the policies that those savages, um, King Leopold and them, carried out. Absolutely. And I think King Leopold actually became the blueprint in many ways for how to conquer the continent. Yes, he inspired so many other people like Cecil Rhodes Mm -hmm. um, and and what he did and also what was done in, you know, South Africa with the Boers and the Afrikaners and all their their foolishness that they did against the native African people there. He, He definitely set the standards. So, Carl, if you had a chance to speak to Adam Hostchild, the author of King Leopold's Ghost, what would be mm-hmm. the one question you would want to ask Adam? I would ask him, honestly, I would ask him, where did he get the conclusion that colonialism was not directly responsible for Africa's condition? Where, where does he his idea that, you know, it, slavery in Africa and all sorts of other, you know, the rights of women, all these other things. Where, I want to know where he got that from. Where does, where is he coming to these conclusions at? Because I think there's a real serious attempt to absolve Europeans of the damage that they have done. Well, again, you mentioned Kanye West about being slavery being a choice. No. Why, why are we trying to absolve them? Of the, of the things that they have done. Why is it we have to feel we need to make the oppressor comfortable? I agree. And that's what came to mind when I saw the author's conclusion. And you had kind of tipped it off to me before I got there, but I agree. I think at the end of the day, Adam Hostchild, um, I, I think what he was doing is what a lot of these guys call you know, staying on code, man. He, he, at the end of the day, he was writing um, this book to kind of let it be known and, you know, what had really happened in the Congo. But um, at the end of the day, he's still going to be on code in that he is not going to really, he's not going to say that that one thing is what has Africa still messed up today. At the end of the day, he's still going to yeah. try to say it's the African right. who's, who, who, who's messed up Africa. And that I find to be complete bullshit. And if, right. I, had, if I had one thing to say to Adam Hochschild, whatever his name is, um, it, it would be that. Why is it you feel the need to make it seem like all of those things could have happened? All the atrocities you spoke about in this book, 
um, all the confusion, all you know, all the craziness. And then at the end of the day, you still say, but Africa is still messed up because of what Africans have done. That that that's not yeah. how life works. That's you know true. What I mean, that's not that's just not how it works, and that was very problematic for me. Um, and it, it should be noted that Adam Hotch, Hostchild, or however you pronounce his, his name, is mm-hmm. a guy from New York City, a white guy of German Jewish descent. Mm-hmm. And that explains it. That exactly. That's why I'm saying it too. That explains it. You see what I'm saying? That explains. You know it. something? That's a very good point. And I also, you know, when we talk about what was going on in the Congo even to this day, could you imagine the state of the United States if someone like George Washington had been assassinated when he first became president or Thomas Jefferson had been killed? And look at what happened in the Congo when we had people like Patrice Lumumba who was brutally murdered by the Belgian government working with the CIA. And then in his place, they put a, a dictator like Mbotu in place. So we can't, you know, they want to try to pretend as though there's a worship of strong men, he said in the book. But who put the strong men in power? Yeah. Who killed the democratically elected leader of the Congo who was going to work and unite, create an African government to, to, to give control over the resources of the Congo to the people? And who had this man killed? Hmm. Yeah, I mean... And, and when you read this book, these are the questions you need to ask yourselves. Speaking of questions, I received a question on Facebook concerning the book. But let me take a, another uh, station ID break, Carl. On, mm-hmm. on the other side, we'll we'll deal with some of the questions that we've received. Um, okay. Okay. So hang in there. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. When will African people have basic rights? When will we be protected? When will our cost of living be eliminated? When will our cultures be preserved? We need a new leadership. One that has studied the problems and learned the solutions. The Pro-Black Compendium is the book to start off that leadership. Quotations, essays, poems, stories, codes of conduct, curricula, principles, relationship advice, marketing tips, group economics, games, book clubs, movie nights, chronologies, civilizations, wars, warriors, authors, songs, conflict resolution, the list goes on. There is no book more necessary for starting our people on the path to African redemption. Greetings, family. This is Koku, host of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. In case you didn't know, we have an online book club called the Bitter Medicine Book Club. Every month, we will select a book to inspire the Bitter Medicine Podcast listening audience to read along together. At the end of the month, we will have a call-in show and book discussion. This is a great, dynamic way for readers to not only enjoy a book, but also have others to bounce ideas off of. They say if you want to keep anything away from black people, put it in a book. Don't allow this to be true. Head over to bittermedicineblogs.com and subscribe to our newsletter for important updates. Do that today. Join our reading collective today and empower yourselves, your family, and your community. Peace and blessings. Peace seeker. 
Malcolm X, John Henry Clark, Joseph Ben Yakinen, Edward Porkchop Davis, and others took notes from Carlos A. Cooks and might not have obtained their nationalistic fervor nor worldview had they not heard Cooks. This is only from the pro-black perspective, author of the pro-black compendium, and Zubiri and the Maroons of Ma'a. I scanned two out-of-print books valuing $800 new on Carlos A. Cooks, the foremost black nationalist after Garvey, and added Cooks magazines into one ebook that I can send you for your reciprocity. Send some love to cash.me slash dollar sign ABS only with the subject Carlos and your email address. And if your love is strong for your people, you'll get a book. If your love is too weak, you'll get a refund and you should double your love next time. Carlos is the missing link who was probably the greatest mind in the world from 1940 to 1966, standing over King and Malcolm like a giant over midgets. These are the missing pages of black history from the 1940s to the 1960s. I just need you to believe in your way of reciprocity, and as you give, you will receive. Cash.me slash dollar sign ABS only. Show me you value your story. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAC Radio. Okay, welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Um, this is your host, Koku, and today we're discussing the June book club reading, uh, King Leopold's Ghost by Adam Hochschild. And um, today I'm joined with the curator of the Bitter Medicine Blogs book club, Mr. Carl Hezekiah, and we're having a discussion about the book. Um, right now we're going to turn to a few of the questions on, on Facebook. Um, concerning the book, we had intended to do a live YouTube show today, but it didn't work out. So instead, I, I threw the, uh, the question out there to submit your questions on Facebook. And uh, Mr. Gunnar DeSeuss, who I had on this show discussing his directorial debut, The Raging Elephant, he submitted the question, who were those Negroes who helped King Leopold destroy the Congo? Now, Carl, we spoke about the Force Publique a little bit, but do you have any other insights of the Force Publique that you want to share with the folks? I think they were no different than any other sellout, you know, Negroes who turn against their own people. I think we don't understand the that white power in Africa relied on black bodies black armies who would be willing to turn against their people. Mm -hmm. That's always been a tactic to be used to, you know, divide and conquer against one another mm -hmm. is to destroy, you know, send your own people against you. Yeah. Um, do you have any other insights into what their motivation was? Was it power well, of think, their own or fear or just fear? I think it was, it was a little bit of both. It was they saw them, uh, an ability to profit off of it. And also, too, I think there there was a lack of a strong black consciousness. They didn't see them as their own people. They saw them as the other. So it's okay to justify force against people who aren't like you. Yeah, that's a good point. That's something we kind of overlook, too. You see, because of the time that we're in, we see Africa as these countries, these 50 plus countries, not recognizing that Africa of old didn't have these borders. It was different tribes in these different regions. And so you could grab a, uh, a guy from one tribe, make him a force public, and he's carrying out atrocities against another tribe. And for, for you know, right or wrong, that tribe could have been like a uh, a warring tribe against his, so he doesn't really care about those people. Right. You know, so there is that too. We we always forget that what, in fact, a lot of the problems in Africa in the last hundred years is because you've put tribal groups into one um, space, you know, one right. into one border, and these tribes were 
pro, you know, had problems with, with each other historically. I think that's what happened in Rwanda. The Hutsis and the Tutsis were people who had problems for generations. And when you right. create this state or this country called Rwanda now, you put them in this border, now you have these two groups enclosed who now are, are still carrying out these decades or centuries old uh, issues that they have. In fact, you and I couldn't pick out a, a, a Hutu and a Tutsi if we tried. We couldn't differentiate. No, we couldn't. That's people. very true. And I think the same was true in um, in the Congo. I think a lot of these false public guys were going up against other Africans they didn't recognize as their own, as you said. And that doesn't make their actions right because, again, and this is what we're working on in, in, in the present day. We got to come to a code of you see a black man, you defend him, and vice versa. Right. We didn't have that code in that time, and that's what allowed a group like the Force Public to be chosen. And let, let's be real, these savage Europeans, they understood that. Yes, they did. <clears throat> yes, they did. And I mentioned earlier about the, the uh, Council of Berlin, how they divided Africa in, in the parts so that way they could benefit from them. That was done deliberately. Put different tribes who didn't like each other, keep them fighting, yeah. and they come in and get the resources. Right. Right. While they're fighting, we'll just sli slip in over here and take up these resources, you know? And that, right. I There's an African proverb that says uh, two men in a burning building don't have time to stop and argue. <laughs> Repeat that for the people again. I like that one. Yeah. Two men in a burning building don't have time to stop and argue. And that's what the Europeans do to you, even to this day. They have you guys, they have us in a burning building. So while we're arguing about, you know, black men versus black women and all this shit there, they're taking you for everything you have. That's right. You know, and that's a podcast I'm going to do in the future. Where we got to talk about this civil war between black men and black women. And, and that quote that you just laid down there, I'm going to have to bring that proverb. I'm going to have to bring that back in that broadcast because that's very important, you know. Yes, it is. <clears throat> Lisa Telemik asks a question, why is it that a genocide managed to remain hidden for so many years. I mean, I personally found out about this less than 15 years ago. That's Lisa's question. Carl, how do you answer that question? Yes. Well, one thing that really bothered me in that book is that technically the author says this is not considered to be a genocide and that the goal was not meant to wipe out all the people, whereas, you know, in situations like uh, in the Herrero in Namibia, or with the Holocaust, that was the goal was to wipe out the people. So they don't technically consider this to be a Holocaust. Their goal was just theft, and people died during theft, and so be it. But I, I really take offense to that. I don't think that you could characterize it as anything but a Holocaust. But in the book, they also mention how records were destroyed. Um, they were in top, they had the chapter of the book called The, the Great Forgetting. Um, even in, in Belgium, they have a museum. Um, they have things such as weapons and, you know, artifacts from Stanley. But they don't mention what happened in the genocide, the millions of people. Because we're talking about 10 million people dying in this. So there was a, a deliberate effort on behalf of the Belgian government to hide this from history. And unfortunately, we have to say that and when it comes down to it, black people's lives don't really matter uh, in this society. It matters to us, but in, in the overarching system, it, it's 10 million black people. They don't really consider that to be a, a big deal, unfortunately. So <clears throat> you made an excellent point there. Um, the author chose to play, to downplay this as a genocide. Mm -hmm. But, 
again, that's him staying on code again. You know, I pointed out his ancestry. That's him staying right. on code again because the truth of the matter is a lot of these Jewish folks, the only genocide they recognize is their own. Their own Holocaust. They don't even recognize the genocide they're doing right now in Palestine. In Palestine, exactly. Exactly. And so that was a calculated move on the author's part, too. You see, when we study African history, we oftentimes will have to read it from a European's work. But we have to understand that at the, even when the European is, is exposing something, they're still protecting something at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, when Gary Webb was exposing um, the crack epidemic and uh, how the U.S. got... He was also protecting something at the same time because... You, 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 you see what I'm saying? So... Right, right. He wasn't going to tell it all because you tell it all, you end up in exile like, like Edward Snowden. You can't come back. Right. So we have to always remember that at the end of the day, any European you see who's spilling the goods or spilling the beans, so to speak, they're still protecting their power paradigm. So they will, they will step around and, uh, and try to avoid saying certain things because they know once they say certain things, they're opening up the power paradigm that they benefit from to further scrutiny from a, from a larger body of people. You see what I'm saying? So, Absolutely. So <clears throat> you have to be very clear in our understanding of that. Um, the other reason why, to answer Lisa's question, the other reason why it managed to remain hidden for so many years and why she only came to know about it about 15 years ago, I came to know about it maybe 20 years ago in college, and uh, the reason is because, again, when you reduce the black human, the African, to less than human status, to be subhuman, those things aren't thought of as atrocities. Those things aren't, because right. it's people who are less than, and this is what happens today. Trayvon Martin gets stalked and killed. It's not a big deal. Because in the psyche of the European mind, the African is not on their level. The African is exactly. not as human as they are. In fact, Africa, black people are less than a dog to white people. That's very true. If the police, if you, if you were to kill a dog on camera, the way they kill some of these black men on camera, heads would roll. Heads would roll. The public outcry, uh, uh, apologies and reparations would have to be given to the dog's owner and all this kind of stuff. That's because they hold their shit higher than the life of a black or African human being. Right. And once we understand that, all of these emotional appeals to white, to, to, to white power, we'll stop all of that dumb shit. Yes, it is. At this point, it, it's foolishness at this point because you can't use moral suasion against somebody who has no morals. Exactly. If you could go and hold the hand of an African child and chop off their hand, and use that hand because, if I remember correctly, in the book they had to, sh they had to, they had like a quota system of hands that they took, and they had yes. to be able to show, and they got paid for how many hands they were able to take. If you can do that, and pay people, and get off on that kind of stuff, there is no moral appeal that will work on you. If you could. Sh Exactly. If you could pull up to a scene and shoot a mayor rice, uh, within two seconds of arriving, looking at a twelve year old I think he was twelve, right? Yeah, look yeah, looking at a twelve year old kid. If you could do that, there is nothing to appeal to. The only appeal you could appeal to is making them afraid for what they do to right. you. Right. Exactly. You have to be able to respond to let them know that for every damage you inflict on us, we will inflict the same on you. In kind. Mutually assured destruction, which is which is how the United States governs the world. We don't invade North Korea because North Korea has nukes. Right. Even though if you invade North Korea, they're going to nuke you. Right. 
Right. And so that's a part of the reason why you haven't heard about it. And the other part of, of it is, is what I talked about at the top of the show is we don't have, and I try to appeal to, to black folks, to Africans every week, we don't have enough of our people participating. We, we, and there is significant brain drain from the black community as well, because even when we, when we produce journalists and historians, they go and they work for white folks. They go and tell mm. their story. They go and write for them. And we need, we need a media. And we need people powering that media that tell these stories. And that we also need a code. Within our code, we need the understanding that we will never forget. And we will never stop talking about what has happened to us. Absolutely. And we will build upon that knowledge to make sure that it never happens again. You see what I'm saying? And so that's why that's you right. haven't heard about it till about 15, 20 years ago because you became an adult, you came into consciousness, and you, 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 you sought information and you came upon this type of stuff. People will talk about Hitler and the Jews, but this guy, Leopold, was worse than Hitler. Yes, he was. <clears throat> but he was worse than Hitler to a gang of Africans. We don't see Africans as human, <clears throat> so it matters not to us. We're not going to talk about it. So if the Africans, really if, if the black folks don't talk about it themselves, no one will talk about it for you. And so we need our youth to start putting themselves, uh, to immerse themselves in history, to immerse themselves in journalism, to immerse themselves in, in writing and, you know, being authors, like only to say from the pro-black perspective, to be bloggers. You know, every week, Carl, I, I put it out there. You, you've seen it, too, on social media. Like, yo, we need bloggers. We need people. And you answered the call. That's how you and I came to know each other. You know, we need people who will sit down and blog. The same way you could write a status or several statuses a day about all the bullshit mm -hmm. going on in black society, you could package that into a blog. And I'm offering those listeners out there, you don't have to have no deep experience. You just have the passion for, for, for your race first, being black first. Have the passion to sit down and write a 500-word piece on some current event that's going on that affects the black collective. Or write about something historically and relating it to something that's going on currently. I have the blog right. space for it at www.bittermedicineblogs.com. Right? You reach out to me, I will put you on as a blogger. I want more people telling our stories. I want uh, someone like yourself, Carl, to eventually... You know, maybe you're going to write your own, you're going to offer your own book off of the blog pieces that you present. I want that for our community because that's what we need. This is why you can live 30 damn years before you hear about the atrocities that happened in the Congo. Absolutely. And that's a shame. No Jewish kid is going to live 30 years before he or she knows about what happened to them in Auschwitz. That's right. They're, they're encouraged to know that history. They're encouraged to, to learn from the mistakes of history. And I, when many times we're told to get over it, move past it. And I, I find that type of thinking to be so damaging. And, and, and my, I'm currently in school now. And when I took my military history class, they could tell any military historian can tell you everything that happened at the Battle of Gettysburg. They can tell you what went wrong. They can tell you what went right. They can tell you the mistakes they made. They can tell you what happened at the Battle of Midway, but yet we're encouraged to forget these things. But yet you learn from the history. You have to learn the mistakes and learn not to repeat it. And we shouldn't mythologize our history. There were great, wonderful things, but there were some mistakes that we did too. And we have to learn from those mistakes to overcome those. So <clears throat> one day in the future, I want to have you on to discuss what you learned in that military history class, because that's something... We really don't have. We don't have. Yeah, we don't. We don't have, and I'm speaking even for me. We don't have a, mm -hmm. a, a, a deep military history, like knowledge of military history, military tactics. 
you know, I heard years ago, and I don't know if this came up in your class or if you've heard this in your own life, but I heard that the British learned a military tactic from the Zulus um, that's still taught today in the army in the mm. U.S., the, the wishbone or something it's called, where, or the, the bull's horn. I, I, I can't remember the name. Though. Yes, it's a, yes I, I know what you're referring to. I know exactly what you mean. It's, it's, a, it's a battle formation they use. Yeah. It's like the horns of a bull. The horns it's of almost a bull, like a, right. they, have, they have a right horn, a left horn, a chest, the loins, the reserves. So they definitely, yeah, they definitely had a battle formation based on a, on a bull. And I'm trying to find the name of it. It's called a, um, a Zulu MP. It's, it's named for an armed body of men. And it was, it was Shaka Zulu who created the, uh, the training and the mobilization, the tactics. It's called the Buffalo Horns. Buffalo it, horns. It's, it's comprised of, yeah, three elements. The horns or the flanking right and left-wing elements. The chest or the central main force, which delivered the coup de grace. The prime fight is made at the composition of the main force and the loins or the reserve used to export success or reinforce elsewhere. Mm-hmm. So it would be, the, the goal was to encircle the enemy. And that's actually what the Zulu did right. in the, um, the battle of, I'm probably going to say it wrong, is Ilwandia, which was probably the greatest defeat inflicted on the British during um, the Zulu Wars, where they lost an overwhelming amount of people. Once the British did not have a, uh, it was a disaster for them. Once they ran out of firepower, just hand to hand combat, the, the Zulu annihilated them. Mm-hmm. And see, we gotta, we need to break that down. So I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work out something with you to to come back another time, and let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about some Absolutely. of the things that, that you learned in you know military history because we don't know these things. The, our press is not going to tell you how we beat them in the past. No, no, they're not. You know, so we got to study it and we got to have our people writing about it. You know, we have to have a culture built around this knowledge. We have to have our songs talk about it. We have to have our art visualize it. We got to start doing this kind of stuff, man. And this is why, you know, again, going back to Lisa's question, this is why... You cannot know about this until you're a full-grown human being. And that's a shame. Right, absolutely. That's a shame. That is a shame. Now, the next question that we got, again, from Gunnar de Seuss, um, he asked the question, did the Moors help King Leopold? Now, a lot of times, from certain sectors of the conscious community, you hear people say, mm-hmm. you know, those Moors, those guys with the fezzes, they were the ones who, who really assisted Europeans and Arabs in catching slaves. Now, the Force Public, mm-hmm. if you look up the Force Public, you look up images of the Force Public, you will see that they're wearing feathers. Right. Now, I think that was just part of the uniform, wasn't it? Right. See, so when this came up before on social media, my response to it was that Leopold and them wanted their soldiers dressed like Belgians. And I think the fez was something worn in, you know, a, 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 a amongst the Belgians and like the Turkish and, you know, and stuff like that. So I think it was right. more so, more, more so what was being worn at the time in Belgium. I don't think it was attached to Moorish beliefs directly. And it sounds like you don't think it was attached to being Moors either. I don't think it was either. Yeah. I don't think they were Islamic or anything, or, you know, Muslims or Moors or what have you. I don't think they were those people. Um, I think they just wore the uniform of Belgium, just like they flew the flag of Belgium at the time, which was a blue flag with a gold star. Right. So I don't think they were Moors. I don't think they were the same people 
when we talk about the Moors who occupied uh, Europe, particularly Spain, for 800 years, I don't think it's those, it's not those people, but they wore uniforms. I, in fact, what I think it is, is uh, the Moor presence in Europe uh, rubbed off on Europeans who wore that fashion that the Moors had, right? Right, and right. So, I would think, the, I would even say as far as the more civilized the, uh, right. the European to a degree. Right. They started taking baths every day. Right. That, that was unheard of back then. Right. And, and the custom of dress and stuff the Europeans took. That's why you have like in the Ottoman Empire, they wore the fez and stuff. That came from, um, from the Moors, right? Right. So right. these people, the fourth public, weren't Moors, but they were they were wearing the uh, the the clothing of the Belgians who were influenced by the Moors. Uh, Gunnar de Sousse also asks, "What's the relationship between Belgium, United Nations, and the U.S.?" Carl, in the book, that's a very good question. Yeah, that is a very good question. In the book, King Leopold's Ghost. What light was shed on the relationship between Belgium, United Nations, and the U.S.? Well, the, uh, the Congo is a source of most of the, the minerals for the, the Europeans' war machine. Mm -hmm. The nuclear weapons, the uranium that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in World War II came from the Congo. The electronics that we use, the cobalt that requires you know, that, that is required for electronics from the PlayStation, the Xbox, we had all those minerals come from the Congo. The United States does not want those minerals to fall into African hands to let African people set the prices on their, on their resources. Because without those resources, the, the war machine stops. Yeah. yeah. So the United States has an has a express role, especially during the Cold War era, in making sure that the Congo uh, stayed within European, or the resources at least, stay within European hands. That led to the assassination of Lumumba because he was feared to have communist sympathies. They did not want those resources to fall into the hands of the Soviets. But in reality, Lumumba had no desire to join with the Russians at all either. Right. But just the idea of him not being aligned or not going along with the program that, that the United States and the CIA and the Belgians wanted them to have, he had to be taken out. He had to be disposed of. So there's, there's a long history of the United States interfering in other people's affairs with the help of former colonial powers like the Belgians. Um, in fact, let me play this clip. I found some time about, uh, ago about the richest natural resources country on earth, the Congo. Take a listen to this. Mm. Okay. Since 1996, over 6 million people have died in the Democratic Republic of the Congo so that we, in the Western world, can benefit from its resources. Congo is extremely rich in gold, diamonds, copper, cobalt, tin, uranium, coltan, and many other precious minerals. Congo has 64% of the Earth's coltan, a precious mineral that is needed for our modern electronics like iPhones, iPads, computers, laptops, PlayStations, Xboxes, Nintendos, jet engines, inkjet printers, and the list goes on and on. In 1946, the Strategic Minerals Stockpiling Act was passed to obtain and stockpile cobalt. With the largest reserves of cobalt on the planet, Congo was targeted. Cobalt is a strategic and critical mineral that is essential for our aerospace, military, and defense industries. As the United States and the United Kingdom provide financial aid and military aid to countries such as Rwanda and Uganda, these neighboring countries plunder Congo's natural resources as the death toll rises. In four studies, the United Nations implicated multinational companies in sourcing coltan from Congo, stating that these companies serve as the engine of the conflict in the DRC. As the world benefits from Congo's riches, 
Congolese men, women, and children continue to be raped, tortured, starved, displaced, and killed. In 2010, a leaked United Nations report cited crimes of genocide may have been committed by the Rwandan troops. There is very little media coverage on what is actually happening in Congo. When Congo is covered by the media, it is often about rebel groups committing mass atrocities. What these reports do not cover are the funding, training, and the arming of these rebel groups by foreign governments. Nothing is ever mentioned about the Western-backed coups, wars, assassinations, or the involvement of foreign corporations in the looting of Congo. Forty-eight women are raped every hour. Millions are displaced. Over six million dead. Half are children under the age of five. What is happening in Congo is a silent holocaust. And there you go. That's King Leopold's ghost right there. Mm. And that's my big issue with the author of King Leopold's Ghost. Because to deny that what's happening now didn't start with what Leopold did in that region. Right, and, it did not. Right? To, 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 to deny that is just ridiculous. Right. And in that piece, we see or we hear how there is definitely a relationship between the U.S., the United Nations, because the United Nations and those groups are covering it up or, or uh, not speaking about it, not reporting it, which is much the same that, uh, as what happened that, that led to uh, Geo Williams, George Washington Williams, writing that letter to Leopold that people weren't talking about, people weren't reporting on the atrocities that were happening. So, Carl, from the book, and even what's going on today, would you agree that all of these guys who Gunnar is asking about are kind of in bed together? Absolutely. They're all in this. Absolutely. So in the book, um, do you remember instances that show how the U.S. was in cahoots with Belgium? Well, there was a, um, especially in the book, they talked about how they had to go before the Congress mm -hmm. in order to get the United States to approve the, um, the Belgians' mandate of, of the Congo. Mm -hmm. And there were certain palms were greased, certain senators were paid off and given a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. So they were aware. And also another thing is that during this time, there was a, oh, yeah, there was a southern senator who wanted to send black people back to Africa. So he was encouraged by the, the Congo being a part of you know, the Belgian government, under the Belgian government, so that way it would serve as a place where he could ship black people back to Africa. I'm glad you brought that up. Um that senator whose name escapes me right now, that senator was big into the idea of blacks going back to Africa. Mm -hmm. And that's a sentiment that has been echoed for hundreds of years now in America of send black folks back. What's your take on why it is the European in America, the white folks in America, wants Africans back in Africa? <laughs> I feel like in their mind, they said, we've done enough for you. You hate this country so much. Go back to where you came from. Mm. That's, that's kind of the idea. We, we've used you. We got what we wanted from you. They, they're almost like they have an idea that life in Africa was absolutely horrible, and they really did us a solid by bringing us to America. Right. Like we did you a favor. And look at how Africa is now, while ignoring the work and the damage they did to put Africa in the state that it is now. So they're saying, go back to Africa is that the way of get rid of us. But it's funny because when Marcus Garvey in the 1920s, you know, bought ships with the Black Star Line to take black people back to Africa, they sabotaged them. Yes. So it's funny that like on one hand, you don't want us 
you want us to leave, but then you don't really want us to leave. You just want us around so you can brutalize us. Once we've used you, you go back to where you came from because you don't want us to brutalize you anymore. That's once, once black people start standing back and demanding their rights and be treated as human beings, then let's go back to Africa. Yeah. Yeah, they don't really want you to go back. I said on a... They don't really want you to go back. I said on a, a broadcast some time ago, I said that truth of the matter is, I believe that if blacks in America started to organize, seriously organize repatriation to Africa, and Africa mm-hmm. on the other side were, were building and, and, and um, making way for blacks in the, in the Americas to repatriate, I honestly believe this white power structure would make it illegal for blacks to move. I believe they would put up something because, you know, they how white folks work is they do what they say they want to do, right? So I believe Absolutely. if that was to begin, they would come up with some law, some way to make it where blacks could not leave America. Why? Because, you see... And again, I talked about this in a previous broadcast. I talked about ego. You see, the the, the ego on a savage is very deep. And Mm. the ego on these white folks, you know, everything white folks do is for ego. Um, You didn't kowtow. You didn't capitulate. You bruised their ego. And now their vengeance is heavy against you. Once you bruise white folks' ego, Expect there to be a counter, right? Because the thing about it is, and I talked about this in the past, is white folks have an ego with other white folks. You know what I'm saying? It's true. If a white guy gets his ego bruised from another white guy, he it's like blood in his eyes. And if he gets his ego bruised from a black guy, it's even worse as far as he's concerned. I've I've actually experienced that personally. And they need Africans here in America to continually boost their ego. Right, right, right. It's, it's almost like I, 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 I understand that, that aggression is endemic within European culture, and they need to have a safety valve. If they do not have a safety valve, they will end up destroying each other. So the, the presence of the other people, black people, is required in order for them not to destroy themselves. They have to vent their aggression someplace else. Yes. Otherwise, it's going to destroy their society. That's, a, that's an excellent point, Carl. I like that point. You're right. Because we established earlier in this broadcast that, you know, white folks were savages to white folks in Europe. Mm-hmm. And when you enter the, the, the African now, the black man, uh, now they could redirect that aggression because see what a lot of us don't understand is white folks were so fucked up in their history you know i talked about this before but rome a lot of people don't understand john henry clark makes this point he said that uh africans took europeans out of two dark ages the dark ages of their inception and the dark ages after the fall of rome so what does that That's tell right. you about Rome? Rome was a fort because even the Europeans in Rome understood and, and they had those kind of cosmopolitan society where there was a lot of Africans walking around in Rome and they knew based on the history that we got our civility from Africa, from Egypt, by way of uh, Greece. They knew that if those fucking Europeans from up north in the areas that's now what's um, Russia and Germany, they knew if those dudes... Germany, yeah. Germany, they know if those dudes won, it would be a dark ages. They knew that. Absolutely. Right? They knew if those savages won. Yeah, as they called it, because the, the Roman legions, one of their greatest defeats was at the hands of a German barbarian yeah. called Armenians. Yeah. So they... As the population swelled, they added more barbarians into their ranks. And what happened was that the Roman, the Roman army began to lose cohesion. Mm-hmm. And it led to their, to their overall defeat. An emperor got killed in battle. 
and it just threw the entire empire in the disarray. So those barbarians that you mentioned, once they became a part of the empire, they helped to undermine it and subvert it. Yes. And so to prevent that power structure from, from losing its viability, you enter the African, mm-hmm. who you could now carry out th- that savagery that you was doing amongst yourselves that was right. breaking down that, that white power union, that white power structure. Now you have the African as the whipping boy. And it's my belief, and it sounds like it's yours as well, that you need the African around in America. You need the continent to be in disarray because if you didn't do that, European savages will be turning on each other. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. That's, that, that idea is explored in a book called Yorugu by Marimba Ani. That, yes. That's a very good, uh, I don't know if you've read that before. That idea is really explored in her book. It's an excellent book. And for those of you listening, Carl did a book review on Urugu that you could go to on www.bittermedicineblogs.com and you could read his review there. Um, but yeah, that's exactly, I guess, I guess the, kind of the thesis of that book. That, Absolutely. You know what I mean? So, uh, Gunnar once again posed a question. He asks about the roles of the church, the nuns mm-hmm. and the priests. Now, we, we kind of touched on it a little bit, but what do you recall mm-hmm. that stood out to you from the book, King Leopold's Ghost, which, which was our June reading for the Bitter Medicine Book Club? What do you recall most about the roles played by the church and the nuns and priests, especially? Uh, they were sent in to pacify the Africans. They, they were also used to not just justify the behavior of the Belgians and the other Europeans who went there, but the idea was to so-called civilize them, to make them Christian, to make them, when the missionaries would come in and give people the Bible and they would lose the land. So the role of the church was really meant to pacify, I feel, the, the Africans who were there, to get them to accept Christianity and also to accept the story of the mark of Cain and, you know, Ham and Noah. So it's, it's been used to almost put black people in the light of we're inferior, we're, you're, we're superior, let us take your land. And once you go through the suffering, then eventually you'll be accepted to heaven and you'll get your reward there. And as I talked about in the broadcast, um, the War on God broadcast I did a couple weeks ago, we really, you know, um, Dr. Claude Anderson talks about that recent years too, how we OD'd on religion even before we met a European or an Arab. We always OD'd on religion and spirituality. And the European was able to, and even the Arab was able to come in there and use that emotional weakness based on religion Mm -hmm. um, against us. I think it was Dr. Henry Clark said something. He said that that, um, black people, we're the true believers. We we out Muhammad, Muhammad. We out Pope the Pope. Yes. And I like that you bring that up because one of the things that always stood out to me about the so-called Christians, these white missionaries in Africa and stuff, is that and it's still the same today. You talk about this humanitarian effort based on your belief in so-called Christ, but none of these guys, very there was only very few of them who had an issue with the fact that people were being killed at a whim. People mm-hmm. were, I mean, whole villages were decimated. Uh, children were being harmed and raped and all that kind of stuff, and you still acted like you were doing God's work. So right. you're, you are correct in quoting Dr. John Henry Clark and saying that we out Christian, all of them. We out God, all of them. Because in our belief system, it's not to say that Africans didn't have internal conflicts. All people do. is is a part of the human condition. But yeah. We we weren't doing that. We weren't raping children and 
man raping man and all that old shit. You know what I mean? Right. There was a humanity that the African people had that that the European lacks. Just lacks. I, mean, I, I was going to say lack. They, 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 don't, they don't have it. And, you know, there have been many theories as to why that is, but I was definitely just based on the behavior and, and you know, what has happened throughout the world. Yeah. You know, in, in dealing with first contact with non-European peoples and, you know, the damage that was wrought. So, um, I see we're still getting question. Um, you know, Gunnar once again asks a question, were there any rebellions? And the answer to that is yes. We talked about all there was, this book talks about a, quite a few instances of, um, of groups of Africans who fought back and died. But, yes. but they didn't die without taking out some Europeans, too. And Absolutely. interestingly enough, what was one of the best um, weapons against Europeans, funny enough, was the tropical environment of the country. Yes. They, they really couldn't take it. Any advantage here. No, they could not. You know, when you read about Stanley, that the first guy who traversed the Congo, uh, damn near died on several occasions. Several times. Yeah. Um, you know, they the, the, the author describes how gaunt and pale and feverish and, you know, even Geo Williams talks about how these guys were dying on... on on the docks and dying on yeah. laying on bamboo um, poles and stuff like that. So the environment has always been difficult for Europeans to navigate in certain parts of the world. You know, I think similar yeah. was true in Haiti. Yes. Yeah. You know, so there was a yellow fever epidemic that that uh, decimated Napoleon's troops. Right. Right. So we have to keep those things in mind, too, that, you know, there's a guy, he, he died about two years ago now, named Dr. Sebi. And Sebi... Ah, Dr. Sebi, yeah. Yeah, Sebi. I would like to do a show on Sebi, too, one day. Uh, Sebi said something that I always resonated with me. He said that one of the problems with Africans now is that we don't eat an African diet. And because we're mm. eating a foreign diet, that's what's getting us sick and killing us. And I, that resonates with me because I tend to agree. I think if you're an African, you need to eat African. You need to be and mm. think African, right? You need to be with Man, other trying. Africans. I am trying. I was going to deep south, and I love southern food. And it is, I am trying my best. I'm getting my son off of meat right now. Mm. Yeah, it's necessary. And I think when I read the book and I read about how the environment was taking out these, these Europeans, that came to mind like, wow, the African was flourishing in that environment and the European was getting wiped out. Yes, yes, it was. So we, take it. Yeah, so we need to get back to our environment as well. We need to get back not only to our thinking, but our environment is what helps us as well. Um. Mm -hmm. Koku, me mentioned about uh, the revolt. On page 260, uh, they talked about the revolt, the revolt in the Kasai region of the normally unwarlike Kuba people mm. that risen to revolt against the rubber terror spurred on as in similar doomed uprisings elsewhere in Africa. So the rebels burned trading posts and mission stations, and mission stations, mission stations as well. So there were many rebellions against the, you know, the, the Belgians and the, the force public in the uh, Congo that we leave out of the history. So that we leave many slave revolts out of the history. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, that answers that other gunner question of named warriors. Well, that's one of the groups of warriors that we had. Um, Carl, is there anything about this book before we go? Is there anything else that stood out to you that you think that even for the person who hasn't read the book yet, that they should know 
Is there anything else from the book that stands out to you? The pictures. The pictures really stood out for me. Okay. Some people are visual learners. Yeah. And the pictures of there's a, there's a picture of a man um, looking at the severed hands and feet of his five year old daughter. Yes. You know, that to me is just is just devastating. Yeah. That's... Because you know that's the so how could you imagine that? Yeah. Yeah. That that, that guy's name was Nasala. Of the district yeah, the of style, Lyon, yeah, yeah, looking at the severed hand and foot of his five-year-old daughter, Boali, right, a, a victim mm-hmm. of the Anglo-Belgian Indian Rubber Company, and they would punish the children if the, if the parents didn't collect enough rubber. Yeah, and this man is probably blaming himself for this, through no fault, but it's through no fault of his own. But in his own way, he did. He, in his mind, I didn't pick enough rubber. And because of that, my, my baby girl lost her hands oh, in the feet. Oh, man, that's horrible. That's horrible. Horrible to think about that. That's horrible to live your life with that burden, you know? And, yeah. And, and that's why we suffer as a people. We still suffer from past atrocities because that's passed on. That, that becomes DNA after a while, you know? Absolutely. It does. And we have to... And, and this is why parents like mothers especially are so protective of sons and you know children in general because we have it in our dna now in our memories that these guys these savage these european savages don't care about children they'll take you out you know what i'm saying you have to live with that yeah. guilt and stuff like that it's tough um but you, you it every day You mentioned something just now that I I think is very important to expand upon. There are pictures in this book. And what stands out about that to me is, you know, a lot of times when we think about, say, slavery, or we think about the past, we think about a time when there was no photography. Mm -hmm. And clearly... This happened, like I said, in 1890 to about 1910. There was photography. There were pictures. Um, Dudes were writing huge books and signing book deals to talk about their conquest of Africa, of the Congo, with pictures. And I had forgotten that in a sense. Like, in a way, I had forgotten, like, you know... Based on his writings alone. Right. I had forgotten that these guys were were selling bestseller books at the time. You know, a lot of early Hollywood stories and stuff, again, like Tarzan is one of the first Hollywood motion pictures with with sound. Um, it, it, It was based off of what was going on in the Congo. Now, it was propaganda because they were talking about really bushmen and all kind of stuff and cannibalism which this book also talks about cannibalism in the congo i i i I found that curious too because my understanding was that there wasn't really cannibalism to that extent in in africa was that your understanding they've always tried to they've always tried to you know dehumanize the people they fight against to justify their oppression so you know, many times they would say these people were cannibals. That's why we had to kill them the way we did. Yeah. Yeah, and so I found that was interesting too. But to get back to the, the, the main point I was trying to make there, you know, you had... Um, what was I saying? You had um, photography at the time. And you mm-hmm. you probably even had... In the latter part of it, you probably had even audio recordings, too. Yeah. So we forget that. So it wasn't difficult for people to know what was going on or to see what was going on because this stuff was out there. But the thing is, this stuff was out there to Europeans, and Europeans applauded it. You know, they... They did. They didn't care. They didn't have any connection with African beings, so they applauded stuff like this. They did. It was only after, you know, so many years that they started forming movements against the uh, the King King Leopold and his 
his uh, his regime in the Congo. You know, they started to have a mass movement similar to uh, the abolition movement in Europe and, and the United States. It was only after so many years it became public knowledge that it decided to put some pressure on on Leopold and his occupation. So, as we wrap up this episode, I want to encourage you guys to read. Reading is not only fundamental, but reading is fundamental to your empowerment. We are trying to provide a platform here, and I want to thank guys like uh, Gunnar DeSouz. I want to thank uh, Lisa Telemik, who participated. Uh, unfortunately, we, did, we weren't able to get the live going so that they could come in and, and post in the chat room. But on Facebook, they did post their questions. And, uh, you know, I appreciate all of you for, for participating, and I want to encourage those of you who did not participate to participate in the future. Um, Carl, is there any last thoughts you have about King Leopold's ghost? Mm. This is a very sobering book. You know, to read about the things we read about, it's, it's very heartbreaking, but I think it's necessary. You know, we, we tend to want to shy away from our history and the things that happened to us that were so heartbreaking and negative, but we need to know these things so that way we can learn and, you know, just also honor the people who went through that. Like we mentioned before, Jewish people don't shy away from what happened in the Holocaust. They have a, um, a memorial to them, yep. righteous among the nations. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they memorize, you know, memorialize people who went through that and the struggle and they survived that. So as African people, we need to honor the people who went through that. So that way they, they don't, they're not forgotten. So I think it's, it's books like this, even though I, you know, my my concerns with it were, were small concerns, but for the most part, it was a very, very good read, very informative, and I think this is something that needs to be remembered. And, and I support the uh, efforts of the the people the people of the Congo and their goal to get reparations from the Belgian government. Also, that's something that you know that that's also mentioned as well. I don't know if they mentioned in the book, but I have heard about them trying to get some some compensation from the things that were done to them. Mm-hmm. Um, while you're, uh, while you're at it, can you give us a, uh, can you give the pitch for why the listeners should join us for the July book reading? Okay. Well, first of all, um, Walter Rodney is probably one of the most, I enjoy his work. He's a Guyanese scholar. Um, unfortunately he was assassinated. But this was a man who had a strong grasp of Pan-Africanism. He understood the effects of European colonialism. And also, too, when you, when you read these books, we need insight from other people because we need other different points of view. We can all learn from each other. And we can, you know, expound the knowledge that we have. Because there's things you know I don't know, the things I know you don't know. The more people we get, the more insight we get, the more of a, you know, a comprehensive view that we get from reading these books. Absolutely. So I I do believe, Carl, you you will intend to write a blog post about this book as well, right? Yes, I do. I I am swamped. I'm writing a paper right now for my uh, early American history class on the uh, the the uh, decimation in, in the Caribbean of the native pa- inhabitants. Mm. So I have to. That's like it's like a ten thousand word paper I got to write. Okay. Once I'm done with that, I will be on this like white on rice. Okay, and then we we look forward to that. Uh, before we go, I want to just read this this thing I, I read on page 266. It, it was about the death of Leopold. And I, mm. I I want my people to hear this, and I want my people to, or our people, I should say, I want our people to to keep this kind of thing in mind. It says, at his death, Leopold was little mourned by his people. They much preferred his nephew and successor, Albert I, modest, likable, and extremely rare for a European monarch. Visibly in love with his wife, because that was one thing with Leopold, him and his wife were at odds. Um, right. As for the world outside Belgium, thanks to Morel and his allies, um, it now thought of Leopold not in terms of the monuments and buildings he was so proud of, but of the severed hands. The American poet Vachel Lindsay declaimed, 
Listen to the yell of Leopold's ghost, burning in hell for his hand-maimed host. Hear how the demons chuckle and yell, cutting his hands off down in hell. Mm. And I want all of you listening, you uh, strong Africans, you black people, we need to keep these things in mind, those four lines. Listen to the yell of Leopold's ghost, burning in hell for his hand-maimed host. Hear how the demons chuckle and yell, cutting his hands off down in hell. I want you guys to begin to celebrate the demise of these Europeans. Man. And mm. it's going to be tough for a lot of you because you're indoctrinated with religion, particularly Christianity and Islam and stuff. But we, the same way they celebrated your death, you have to celebrate theirs as well. And if there's a hell, I hope a guy like Leopold is burning in it with his hands being cut off every, every day, every moment of time. I hope they grow back so they can cut them off again, over and over again. Over and over again. I hope that's his <laughs> hell going forward. And, you know, on that note, I want to thank my guest today, Carl Hezekiah. Carl should, will be on at the end of the month of July to talk about the upcoming reading that we're doing for the book club this month. And I really enjoyed this book, Carl. Thanks for putting me on to it. Thanks for putting the, view, the, the listeners on to it. And Carl and everyone, I want you guys to take care. Until the next time, this has been the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, bittermedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Bitter Medicine Show, Twitter, Bitter Meds, Tumblr, Bitter Meds, Instagram, Bitter Medicine.